Welcome to the Arbitrarium. I'm your host, Matt Gamble. And here joined with me are Garrett Harriman. And what's your name again? John. Don't, not that one. You could have picked, <laughs> picked, 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 picked any name. <laughs> Paul Newman. Oh, yeah. Paul Newman. Gary Oldman. <laughs> At this point, you should know my voice. David James Perry. Even with it stuffed with bacon, turkey, and bread. Yep. Yes. Yep. Wonderful bacon. We were talking about gallantry. Yeah. How to die gallantly. Well, let's define gallantry. Yeah, this is not like... So I guess we're titling this episode Cincy Musings. We're in Cincinnati, so I'm having breakfast. Oh, yeah. I'm having coffee. I'm having, yes, food and, a, and, a, and a tea because I'm fancy. Turkey, turkey, bacon, and hummus sandwich, and Earl Grey. And why are we so slow to getting this started? Uh, I don't know. There's a few reasons. So we were talking about gallantry. We started with the gallantry, and then we we talked about food. So yeah, yeah gallantry. So gallantry. I, I I can't Google it because my phone's dead. Right. In the case of dying gallantly, which is what I what I was talking about, you know, dying in a way that is admirable and brave. Dying honorably. Hmm. Partially. Is there a difference between dying honorably and dying gallantly? I'd say one can die gallantly, or if one dies gallantly, then they die honorably. But one can die honorably without dying gallantly. I think one could be gallant without honor. Yeah, definitely. I, I think of that. like, when I think of somebody who's gallant without honor, I think of, you know, like the, I should like fantasy movies or whatever, there's always like the, the pretty boy prick. <laughs> yeah, he's gallant, mm -hmm. but like the not honorable. Like the bad guy in Frozen. Yeah, I was thinking Gaston. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's some gallantry to that. Jamie Lannister, maybe. Yes. At the beginning. Gallantry, the worldly, successful, attractive, chivalrous. I don't know if I can chivalrous under gallant necessarily in order to be chivalrous one must be gallant true so it's that old philosophical phrase all s's are p's but not all p's are s's you ever heard that no i've no, never heard that i've never actually heard that all whales are mammal but not all mammals are whale mm -hmm. yeah that I am. oh so those are variables p and s okay, okay. yeah I don't know what they stand for. I didn't actually take that class. Proposition is one of them. Supposition? I, I suppose, yeah, proposition is supposition. So all propositions have suppositions, but not all... I would say all suppositions are propositions, but not all propositions are suppositions. Yes. That, that makes sense. Yeah, when we took our logic course, which, by the way, if you're listening, Take a logic course. It's the best damn course you will ever take in your life. Do it now. Do it now, nerd. Did you both take that class at the same time? Yeah, we, yeah, took, it we took it together. Yeah. I remember when you took that because you started tearing me apart. <laughs> 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 I would start. I would start making some argument about something. And you were just no, no, no. That's that's a that's a straw man or something. I was just like, <laughs> oh yeah. So like, where the fuck is this coming from? Like, <laughs> I learned it at college. Yeah. Listen here, college boy, with your smart <laughs> words. And the funny thing is, I was in college before you. It's true. It's true. Yeah, I, the thing I, I loved about the logic course was not only the subject material, but the person who was teaching, Dave and I. Okay, tell me about this person. David Pfeiffer. Yeah. David Pfeiffer. De Fife. We, we called him De Fife. And I, I think this man. How was old is this man? What does he look like? Old. Paint. Okay. He was old. Paint me a picture of the of the Pfeiffer. Short. Old. Why am I picturing? Wispy balding man. The professor from Hogwarts. From what? The Hogwarts. Which one? I don't know. There's Dumb the really Dumbledore? short one. The half-dead Dumbledore. Dumbledore? No, the the like history teacher that died and like kept teaching. <laughs> oh, I I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I can see that. I can't remember. It's, but, it's kind yeah. of like five. It's probably That's a bad. Be really loud. Yeah, it's gonna be really loud. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what it was either. But anytime, if you know, you know. Anytime D5 <laughs> would stop and think about what he was about to say. His eyes would always roll back, his mouth would open, and was like, is it happening? Is he finally stroking out? 
I mean, <laughs> this long, awkward pause where he's just staring off into the middle distance. <laughs> it's like when you stutter and you you are consciously doing it. You're just like, I shouldn't do that again. Then you do it again. You're just like, did I do? Did, is is it becoming a thing now? Like, <laughs> God knows it is for me. He's the one who taught me to start stuttering because it made me sound more human. I like how you I just that did you. it too. Yeah, actually, actually, yeah. So I learned. There, there's like a conversational charm to it. I, there it is. Yeah, there it is. I learned the conversational study stutter that Matt Gamble has through Dave. Transitively. What, what have I done? You ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had a Freudian slip the other day. I was sitting down to breakfast with my wife, and I meant to say, honey, can you pass the salt? But what came out of my mouth was, you bitch, you've ruined my life. <laughs> the longest time I thought a Freudian slip was um, slipping in the mess you made after pleasing yourself. Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> that would be somewhat of a form of Freudian slip. There was a guy. Is that an Oedipus slip? An Oedipal slip? No, that's when you land on your mother. <laughs> You slip on your. <laughs> there once was a man named Oedipus Rex. You may have heard about his odd complex. His name appears in Freud's index because he loved his mother. <laughs> Why does that sound like a song that was written in the 30s? Exactly. Poisoning pigeons in the park. That's, that is. Uh, is Tom, this the same Tom, guy? Tom Lair, yeah. yeah. Holy shit! Yep, that's Tom Lair. Uh, I just like Google album, image searched that like with my brain. <laughs> it was from his album, I believe, um, "Songs and More Songs" with Tom Lehrer. <laughs> It's such a whimsical. That's what he did. Yeah, whimsy. The masochism tango. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like there's uh, some whimsiness to uh, some whimsical nature to gallantry? Yes, definitely. It's it's a very romantic concept. Yes. Um, Do you mind? We're recording. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Not you. <laughs> You're good. I was yelling at the truck. <laughs> Good to Have see you guys. Day. You too. Good to see you. <laughs> this is gonna feel more like an episode of the Myriad Creatures. <laughs> yeah. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. I can't pull the bait and switch. It was with what I was going to do. <laughs> well, I mean, we're we're recording the way that the Myriad Creatures records. True. So it's gonna In have public. that flavor to it. Yeah. Yes. It's noise and whatnot. I wish that my Zoom H3 never broke because I had this thing that I would do with it where I had this like first person. So it's like two condenser mics that are aimed at each other. Mm -hmm. So like if you like snap around it and you've got earphones on, you can like hear it snap. Mm -hmm. It records in stereo. It's in 3D, yeah. Wow. And I would do things with that that you would just, when you listen to it, like you can pick up everything at the same time. And it's just, it was like, I wanted to do experimental shit with it. like. Mm -hmm do things that no man has ever done with a microphone because it wouldn't let him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go where no man has been consciously. Previously. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. yeah, there's a romantic na notion to to dying gallantly and gallantry in general, but it kind of goes back to that materialism versus I, I, idealism thing. I would consider you to be a romantic. Oh, definitely. He's definitely a romantic. Yeah. Undeniably. Guilty as charged. <laughs> I mean, you tried to teach a group of partiers how to sword fight. Yeah. For I me. would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for that little dog. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I can't picture gallantry without a horse. There's always a horse involved. I don't. Of course, there are certain things that involve a horse. I think that's gallop tree. <laughs> I, I read a lot of military history. It's one of the things that I'm into, and and the stories that always get me choked up are those of, of sacrifice, uh, dying for something greater than yourself, going into it knowing you're going to die. Um, if you if people have seen Black Hawk Down, no. um, the the scene with the two snipers, Shugart and Gordon, they know they're going in. They know they're not going to get out, but they're going to do the right thing and protect this man anyway. Uh, that gets me. It's like, there is no logical reason to do that. That is a pure romantic notion, but it was the right thing to do. Um, so it goes back into ethics. Would that be ethics? That would be more morals than ethics. And yeah, ethics is more like... 
proper, improper, morals is good or bad. Right, and ethics is usually like in reference to a particular field of something or area of something. So I guess morality is like ethics with emotions attached to it. It's the life ethics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ethics, or no, rules are, exist for people who don't know ethics. <laughs> you ever heard that phrase? No. <laughs> I do find it funny that one of the most frequently stolen books are those on ethics. <laughs> <laughs> well, Abby Hoffman wrote a book called Steal This Book, and it couldn't be sold. The only, <laughs> the only way it could be properly sold is if they kept it behind the counter, because people kept stealing it. <laughs> and he also got lambasted because um, a lot of the book just went into everything that poor people did at the time to, to fuck the system. So, like, all these techniques for sur the, the poor people used to survive were put into a book and then couldn't be used anymore <laughs> because ev everyone knew them and uh, then the system started to fix itself yep. too. Like, yep. I, that's one way to get about go around doing that kind of thing. Be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> see, that's one of those weird effects that, like, it just reminds me of certain psychological effects. Like, once you understand a certain psychological pattern that like happens in your own head. Mm -hmm it stops working the same way because now you're aware of it and then you actively start to change it. It's like setting your car clock 13 minutes fast mm -hmm. and then you start and you to know. compensate for yeah. it. <laughs> That's why I, when my, my mom always had her car clock set on like 10 minutes fast. Mm -hmm. But then she would always, every time she looked at the clock, she would say it out loud. She would say like, oh, so it's, 20, it's 1226, oh, yeah. so that means it's actually 1236. All so right. when I would Where's be in the car when she wasn't in there, here. I would there randomly there. take it up and down <laughs> the different notches. And I wouldn't even look at it as I did it. So I'd be like, if I don't know, then there's no way that you know. <laughs> <laughs> you think your mom listens to the uh, uh, myriad creatures? I hope not. <laughs> I'm uh, sure she doesn't listen to the arbitrarian. So she she gave me something the other down. day. She gave, she was like asking me about oh, I forget what it was. She was like giving me something, and she was like thinking out loud, doing that thing that we all mm -hmm. do. And she was like, um, so "What was the word she used? What's the, like a romantic word for starts with A, like flirting?" Though you're a, 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 a word that starts with A for the for flirting for like rom I, I, I'm romantic I'm, flirting. Um, I mean, courting is usually what I think of when she she thought something out loud about my sexual life and then was just like I don't want to know that and this <laughs> and, and I, I can't remember what the hell I don't even, I don't remember any this is not helping anyone. <laughs> <laughs> God, I can't even. Yeah, there's no context. <laughs> it's like it's um, so when I entered the only philosophy class I ever took, the, there was a quote, and I wonder if you can help me finish it. Philosophy is like searching for a black cat on a dark night in a room with no lights during a storm, and the cat might not even be there. I know <laughs> what quote you're talking about. I don't remember how it goes. Though. I do I not do, remember. I that do quote vaguely at all. remember that at some point. Philosophy is like searching for a black cat on a black night with no lights and the cat might not even be there. <laughs> I mean, that's a good description. I mean, I don't feel like it is. Mostly because, like, philosophy's not... Like, when, when you're diving into philosophy, you're still working with real things. I think you're the just, person... I'm sorry. You're, you're just like... Um, it's not even necessarily suppositions because you can you can come up with things in philosophy that are like based on logic, right? Yes. This means this, and this means this, and this means this, and if well, you, you go connect things in this way, then you, you end up with Descartes. Like this. I mean, he, the, he, the whole "I am thinking, therefore I exist" came about because he came up with a scenario where he couldn't trust anything at all. Like he had to. He had to build from the ground something. up. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd say that the looking for black cat in a black room in a dark night, and it might not even be there, is apt. Because yes, logic is logic is a tool mm. that you use to explore philosophy. There are other tools that you can use, but you have to have a tool to make it. But a tool. you're you're still experimenting in your own head. Okay, does this work? Does this not? Right. You're you're waving your hands around looking for the truth. The truth being the black cat, and it might yeah. 
that that makes sense in my brain. See, now I think it's interesting that the it's person... It's never felt that nebulous to me. But. I think it's interesting that the person uses a cat, because it's almost like they just put themselves in the box with Schrodinger's cat. Have, Have you, you heard of Schrodinger sauce? <laughs> I'm I'm aware that it could exist. <laughs> well, one of the space pirate snacks of the future was Schrodinger sauce. Schrodinger sauce. And it was it, it has like uh, like a uh, Fabio type guy that's holding the thing, and it's, I can't believe it's not there. Now in mild. <laughs> uh, Is it spicy? We don't know. You have to put it on your tongue to find out. <laughs> it may sublimate if you open the canister. <laughs> That's a word I love, sublimate. Sublimate. And what it, what it is, going from solid directly to a gas. Yeah. Th that's wild. We make uh, Schrodinger sauce with the maybe pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it's spelled M-A-I-B-Y, maybe. Possibly. No one knows. Hmm. English is my second language. Bad English being your first? Uh, bullshit. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You are a bullshit artist, that is that is for sure. A practice dissembler. He's not even here right now. Are as you? It turns out. I mean, I'm touching him, but... Well, you gotta t do it louder for the audience. <laughs> Touch me louder for the audience. That's the name I of the song I'm writing. I think <laughs> oh. oh. That's It's the name of my memoir. <laughs> Touch me louder <laughs> for the audience. For the audience. <laughs> it has to be for the audience has to be like the subtitle, the subscript. Touch me louder for the audience. Fortunately, today you can self-publish that. So, yes, I'm working on it. I actually have a working title for mine. It's not really a memoir though. It's like I mean, it's I guess part memoir. The whole philosophy book is called uh, A View from Without. <laughs> Okay. Which was going to be a working title, but it, it's grown on me. I actually really like the title. It seems like something that Woody Allen would write. I don't know. If I'm going to tentatively like a, say thank you. That seems like a backwards <laughs> compliment. Yeah. I'm sorry. Ten, I mean, that that is the best a tentative my, thank you, because I do. I've enjoyed some of his films. To the best of my knowledge, Dave is not a um, made sexual advances on his adopted stepdaughter. Oy. No, and I don't want to think about that because. No. I watched uh, Manhattan because it's in the Criterion Collection. I don't know what that movie is. It's a Woody Allen film okay. from the 60s. I think so. Visually stunning. It's black and white. Mm -hmm. Like, cinematography-wise, it is one of the most gorgeous films ever. But if you analyze the writing, it's Woody Allen trying to seduce a 17-year-old. And there's zero sexual chemistry. It, he's just talking through it the whole time, and it's just like, why was anyone okay with this? And how did nobody see that coming? Well, that kind of <laughs> shit was, if it was, if it was considered artsy, you know, you could get away with that shit. I mean, you know, it was, it, it's like all the shit, all the people that were involved with like Andy Warhol and Studio Fifty Four and all that. Like, it's all those same, the, the, just the group, that group of people that came up through that that pipeline. You know, I'm gonna use a word. What? Problematic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, now it's on. Now it's on the arbitrary. <laughs> I hate how that word has been co-opted. Hitler. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna have to note that. Yeah, we're gonna have to remember to, to add to the Hitler count. Sorry, I, I was gonna say it earlier, but I was stalling. <laughs> hey, do you know that every fascist dictator was obsessed with American movies? Yeah. Yeah, Stalin I, I would watch that. movies every night, so would Hitler. Like American movies. They were obsessed with American movies. Mm -hmm. Could we please use German nationalist party leader? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we not just be added named. three. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and well, with, with him in particular, he was obsessed with. The one I always remember that he was obsessed with was Snow White. He absolutely, lo absolutely loved Snow White. But, I mean, that's a German fairy tale, so. Maybe that's part of it. So where I work, they have these these big these big box making printers from Germany, mm -hmm. and they have the American flag on one side and the German flag on the other. And every time I walk through there, what pops in my head is Deutschland, Deutschland über alles. <laughs> I can't help it. And because everyone's wearing earplugs in the factory, 
I just belt it out and no one no one cares. No one notices. <coughs> See, working as a meat cutter, we're all slightly unhinged. And like, <laughs> it, 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 you look at each person and think like, they're wild, they, they look wildly different. But each and every one of us will randomly just kick our way through the doorway and start yelling about something. <laughs> like, just like, at the top of our lungs for no reason. Like, uh, it was really funny. <laughs> Um, so Eddie, twice divorced from New Jersey, uh, 61. Mm -hmm. You can already imagine everything that entails that. So we're talking, and uh, we're in we're in the meet room, and Jeff is in the back room, and Jeff had just gotten engaged. To, he Jeff is also divorced, and then started dating the, this woman that they met through their kids' soccer. And so uh, Jeff is now engaged to get married, and Eddie's just like, hey, don't ever get married. It's the biggest mistake in your life. Don't ever, don't ever, no matter what you do, don't ever get married. So, hey, Jeff, you're getting married soon, right? And Jeff goes, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff goes, what? He goes, nothing. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've found marriage pretty nice, actually. I know, and, and like, I'm I looking forward to it when it, if it happens. Yeah, like I see people get married all the time, and I think like you know, especially growing up in a religious family, like I thought I was gonna be married and have kids by like my early twenties. <laughs> and yeah, I'm 33 now, and there is no danger of that anytime soon. Yeah, I actually did think that I would have at least been in, in a marriageable relationship by the time I was 34. And Nope. Does your ex-roommate listen to this podcast? Yes. I think. I, I think cohabitating with a female sidelined you a little bit. No offense to... Uh, that, that, same that thing is, for years. Well, many, many people did. Um, I never felt that way, but... Yeah. I mean, I think regardless of whether you felt that way or not, if it was apparent to people around you, it's going to be way apparent to people that might have been interested in you. Well, yeah. And it was ex-girlfriend as well, so... Yeah. Hey. Imagine well, I consoled to... myself and other <laughs> interested parties with, it's okay. Well, you know, I'm not going to say that on a recording because that's not my story to tell. But there was a... You both know the reason for that. Yeah. Yeah. We could... Based on the years that we've known each other, if we started talking about anybody that we mutually know, it would get back to bite one of us in the ass. Oh, yeah. It would. I've already thought about referencing several people, and it's just like, no, <laughs> bad idea. <laughs> bad idea. There's, we have an episode that I've written, or an idea for an episode that I really, really want to do, but um, I'm too embarrassed to ask the one person who would be able to give us the best input. You know her. Yeah. We're not going to mention the name. No. When we pause for a break, I'll mention the name. This is one of those games that we're going to have to constantly play. Um, we like, got to give the audience something. So the, tell them at least what the, the subject is. We don't uh, have the subject for the. the well, I already came podcast. out with the H word. So if we can play the game without doing the, that. I, I want to talk to someone who would be in the know on the effect that more advanced sex dolls would have on the sex worker industry. Which is actually an interesting topic. I know my brother used to have a flashlight. I'm comfortable with saying that out loud. <laughs> I mean, you keep it in the top drawer so it's easy to find. That's just like common courtesy. It Clean it out. <laughs> yeah, you don't often think about the fact that there's maintenance involved in that. Yeah. There's the uh, there's the post. Somebody was making a joke on the Tasteful Nude page about the watching porn. Oh, that's so hot. Oh yeah, that was yeah. Jen, actually. Cl climax, and then immediately, what is this filth? Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, now you have to clean it up. You're your own janitor. <laughs> it's an investment, too. Those things are not cheap. No. I can't, I can't justify spending that kind of money on something like that. But is it preferable to the hand? I don't know. As a perpetually single person. I wouldn't want to have to clean it, though. That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. You're making a commitment. Yeah. So the sex doll is, like, next level. Yes. Do they weigh as much as a human being? I don't know. I don't I, think they weigh as much. I've never manhandled one, so I can't tell you. I would, I would assume they don't weigh as much, because you still need to be able to move this thing around relatively easily. Well, I know, but they make the one versions that aren't even the full body, so... Yeah. They... I that guess seems you have just the creepy to me. Yeah. Huh. 
That's objectifying. See, I don't uh, like any of it, but I will say this. The part that's only that part seems less creepy to me because I don't have these weird dead eyes that I'm looking right. to. Like that gets me. Yeah, they, I, I can't. I can't do this. I can't do that. It's just weird. What do they say? We, how many active serial killers do we have at any given time? Like twenty to thirty or fifty? I do not know. So, I don't know. I've so, never so looked how, into that. How many? How many? Is this curbing any of that? The shame of it would would. There's well, there's it, it, there's a sadness. Violent crime is you know has been going down for decades uh, since the internet became a thing. So may, maybe why. it is. Beware any man that owns a pig farm. <laughs> I know a guy. <laughs> do you? I do. Has he made any questionable statements? As much as anyone who owns a pig farm has. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfectly vague. <laughs> There's a certain no, amount of it that comes with the territory yeah. of owning a pig farm. <laughs> There's a... Um, I think just the option of... If you were married and, and you asked your wife... If, she, if you brought up buying a pig farm to your wife, you there's a 50% chance that you're going to discuss divorce in the next sentence. <laughs> in the next sentence. Well, I got lucky, because Kat and I have been talking about homesteading, getting into that. And you, the thing that hogs are great at is turning waste into more food. That's what they do. And there's only a few things they won't eat and turn into more pig. So... And I don't wear those socks anymore. So. Right. So bringing that up, it's like that's a good idea. So I, I think I don't think divorce is in the in the cards talking about a pig farm. Other things maybe, but not the pig farm. And if you got oh, some goats, you'd never have to mow your lawn again. I wanted to get alpacas for our current place for that exact reason. Do they eat grass? They eat grass. Yeah, and unlike like goats and sheep, they they don't eat it down to the root. They leave. It's like it's like a lawnmower, and their poop is quite valuable as fertilizer. Did you? Did you, either of you ever hear Bob Glidden's story about almost yes. getting killed by his llama? Yeah, we were in the same class with Glidden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear that story? He had to kill a llama with a shotgun because he <laughs> it was wasn't a male being, llama because it was being aggressive. It was. It tried to stomp him to death. Wow. And he barely got out of the pen, and like to his two slugs. Yeah. <laughs> Double tap. I'm gonna refer to him as Two Slugs Glidden from now on. <laughs> Is it weird to say, like, I'm surprised he's still alive? <laughs> I don't think it's that weird. I mean, he's... We love Glidden, but he's a bigger dude. He was he built had, like a basketball. He had white hair back when he we He was older him. then, yeah. He doesn't look like he's aged, but I haven't seen a current picture of him. Yeah, I haven't... I can see that he's aged a bit, but not as much as you would think. The last time I saw Glidden was 15 years ago, so... He's actually relatively active on Facebook, but, I mean, his... And the nicest way I can say this is his wife passed away a few years back, so oh. and now he's on his own. I mean, she was in poor health when, when we were in yeah. high school. I remember she came to prom, and like, I think she couldn't like stand on her own. There's something I should do. I should do a new Glidden comic. There you go. Send it to him. I think he'd enjoy that. I think it was Ashley Kincaid who, on the first day of class, asked him a question. No, that was Susie. That was, it was Susie, Susie Brown. Because yeah, I guess we Susie know Brown. who the bitch is. Yep, because she walked out. <laughs> she came back later, and they ended up with a good relationship. But that was Susie Brown. I remember being just shocked. I laughed. I thought it was funny. I had heard enough stories about Glidden that it didn't really surprise me. It's like oh, I, I never had Glidden. I never did class. I think it's kind of like you... We, you might see a bear on the trail, but when you actually see one, you're like, holy shit, that's a bear. Like, I wish this guy would shut his fucking car off. <laughs> hey, do you mind? Oh, you're, you're, you're good. Not you, you're good. <laughs> you did it. Hey. Excuse me? <laughs> you did it this time. Right. Uh, yeah. How old is Break it? time? Yeah. yeah, let's take a, I think a, a yeah, break. We're probably, probably, about, probably about there. Yep, right. Almost right at thirty minutes. All right, cool, cool. All right, gonna take and a break. We'll come back and we're gonna talk about things. Oh, you're the, the host. These are our sponsor. Everyone needs a private place in their home for private things. Bathrooms are too conspicuous. Bedrooms and living rooms are either too public or too hard to clean. The laundry room, despite the pleasing vibrations 
too noisy. What you need, my friend, is a custom room for your personal needs. I'm Jack Freely, contractor and master handyman. Whether it's as common as a wall-mounted lotion dispenser or the latest in South Korean melon warmers, Glory Home Solutions will polish that old nursery into a brand spanking new custom ejacularium. Glory Home Solutions, come inside. And welcome back. Dead air, dead air, dead air, dead air, dead air. Dead air. <laughs> uh. Usually we try and think of something. I asked right before we started back up, what are we going to talk about? And they were like, I don't know. Let's just go with it. And here we are. Well, I, I made the mistake of being a little too self-reflective, I think. <laughs> and now you, you're down that path? Yeah, in my head. Well, we had some drinks last night. And I am the only one who has not gotten food. My stomach has started growling, even though I'm not actually hungry. So yeah. Hmm. You should be hungry though. It's been a while since you've eaten. And you've drank since the last time you've eaten. You want a bagel? No, he had a pizza. Oh, that's right. You had the pizza. I did. That's right. Part of yeah, two slices. Last night, you guys both went off to do something. And for like 20 minutes, I was just abandoned. Oh, well, I, I, I actually came <laughs> back and I saw that you were having a conversation with people. And I was like, I'm yeah, just going to let this happen. Yeah, and she got left immediately afterward. Oh, no, that was, okay, that was before I saw that. She, you were still talking to her when I got up to go get a drink, and then when I came back, she was gone. Okay, yeah. And I, I got the feeling that she was dragged away by her boyfriend. Mm. I'm going to steal one of these. There's nothing in there. Oh, yeah, we gotta, but, gotta pick up some more. Oh, he's got another pack. Hey. Witness me. Witness. Testify. There, yeah, there was, uh, what was her name, Cindy, I think? The third, those three girls that came toward the end, one of them, I think her name was Cindy, she was pretty cute, but it was another one situation where was like, I'm in Cincinnati, this can't possibly go anywhere. I like I've talking. sabotaged a lot of potential relationships by thinking that way. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to have to drive two hours to see this person. Right. You know, not, not every time I want to see them. We remember your ex-girlfriend's ex-boyfriend. I'm going to do that too, actually. My ex-girlfriend's ex-boyfriend? Yes, um... One of the most oh, bland oh, men Dane. who ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> yep. I didn't want to throw any names out there. Uh, nobody's going to know him by his first name. Uh, Dave? There you go. <laughs> Indeed. Dane. I, was, I wanted to let that happen, but at the same time, it's like... Then he's just going to grab another one. Right. I almost lit the, I, what lit I thought the cigarette happened, backwards. So. What I thought happened was you two doing the same thing to me that you used to do to him. That, that crossed my mind. I which wasn't going to was, leave, leave, but... Which was, you two would go to a party, and then you'd just bail, leaving him there. <laughs> you'd introduce me to a few people, and then you'd leave. <laughs> so that I would have to talk to people. I learned that trick from Nick Waterfall. <laughs> Nick, uh... Nick grew up with, like, a really close group of... Like, him, Danny, and Craig were, like, inseparable. Yeah. And so when he started dating Ariel in uh, high school, and they got, like, serious... Like they would be hanging out and like none of them would be talking because the the two friends had like nothing in common with Ariel and it was like you're taking our friend away from us. <laughs> so he would like purposely like leave them in the kitchen and be like, Oh I gotta go like like go So they'd have to talk So they'd have to interact with each other and form their own relationship and like I was fascinated by the consciousness of I feel he like was, it worked because I remember them hanging out. Like, well, I remember Ariel. He was such a self-aware person, I think, before a lot of... I think, like, I started to become more self-aware by listening to him, like, discuss things. Like, we were at... There was a house on, like, a youth retreat, and, like, there were two... There were these two oldest, like, older couple that would help out with the youth group. They weren't, like, official, but they were, like... They would be extra hands on the trips, and, like... It was just cool older people that loved young people. And like they're in the kitchen of this old house that was like a church house. Mm -hmm. And Nick is sitting there talking about CIY. Uh, and he's like, it's very much like, he goes, but don't you think it's very much like the Nazis with like the, with the lights and the music? Like they're, they're forcing these, like you, you're, you're gonna have the these like yeah. mountaintop come to Jesus experiences because your emotions are heightened 
you're like mentally engaged. Everything, everyone around you is doing the same stuff. He goes, he goes, he was like, he was like, it's the same stuff that the Nazis used to do to get people more into the system. And I was just like, and and like I was a full Jesus pill person at that time of my life. No offense to anybody who is a Christian, but um, and and so to just be like, he's right. Like, cause I used to go down to like the stage when they would call people mm. that wanted to like rededicate their, and it's almost like, like why am I doing this? Why am I crying? Like why am I, like I haven't killed anybody. Like I haven't like that you know of. Well, I'm, I, there's a lot of repression that gets instilled <laughs> into religious people in general. That I I think that's one of the reasons why I mean, you were talking about. I'm the kind of person that never figured out what to do with my life, so I'm constantly trying new things. Yeah. I think part of the that is because of that like I was like I don't like this programming I never did either yeah I was actually having that conversation with somebody recently I can't remember who oh it was one of the girls I was talking to um, and dog I just never liked the and we me and I've had this conversation too I've, I've been a Christian my entire life but I never liked the the weird ritual of everybody doing the same thing at the same time it just it, there's something about that that rubs me the wrong way. I don't feel like it's personal. I feel like it's just a thing that people are doing, and so many of them don't know why they're really doing it. They just know this is what you do at church. See, I like the ritual. I I, I do. Um, it's not I that bad if you're particularly <coughs> self-aware. I'm also someone who uh, I take to programming quite quickly. I know this. <laughs> well, we talked about you leaving the army. Yeah. You, you like had a crisis of like identity. Well, I, but I think there's a, there's a difference in ritual versus I, I don't even know what to call it. But it's like when you ask your dad why you're doing you're supposed to do something, and he doesn't want to deal with this, so he just goes because I said so. Mm -hmm. And it's just like it's not a good enough answer. It was never a good enough answer for me. Like I, I don't know. Like it's like you're studying the Old Testament, and it's like they're using this because this is goes into their sermon. This is the sermon that they wanted to deliver today. But then they start to list these details for these things and you're just like, well that's interesting. So then you go and look into the Bible and it's telling you all this stuff like it like like they reference like the Nephilim. Yeah. And it's just like boom, one sentence. And you're like, well what the hell's that? And then you find out that somehow there are these giant beings that existed before people and then you're like, but there's only one sentence there. Like why don't the, how do you how do we know that there's more to that? And then I where is that information? I think it's like, cross-referencing from uh, things that aren't in the actual canon, but are recorded from around that time. Yeah. One thing that I've, I, I find interesting, this comes from studying history, is the Old Testament was not taught or preached or studied by proper Christians for almost a thousand years. It was, it was considered like, no, this is, this is the book the of the Jewish, Jews. Yeah. This, this is their book. We we have our book. This was this you know everything in, the, in everything in the New Testament just throws the Old Testament out, which isn't and, true if you if you've read the New Testament. Well, yeah, I mean, and then you've got like the teachings of Jesus versus the teachings of Paul, which are sometimes divergent in and of themselves. Like, <clears throat> but we're going the, down there. The reason why we started reading the Old Testament again had to do with. Uh, some of the, the later sects of Christianity to break away during the Protestant Reformation, and like, okay, we need to understand Jesus more. Didn't they want to read? Didn't they like have the guy to like rewrite the Bible by relearning Hebrew? And then they found out that like all all these translations are wrong. Uh, it wasn't Hebrew; it was Greek. The Septuagint. I love it. Yeah. I mean the the oldest the oldest like modern readable Bible by a modern language is the Greek New Testament. It is it is the most unadulterated. But they still teach Greek. My brother had to learn Greek. Like one of the people that I, I went to a Christian college for two years. Mm -hmm. President, freshman, sophomore class, this guy. <laughs> uh, that's another one of those uh, I'm gonna not believe in the system <laughs> because the system gets people like me in charge. <laughs> Is that a Mark? Uh, I was gonna say a Marxism, but that yeah. I mean something else. I felt it's a Groucho-ism. I felt more like the mayor of Spin City. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be a member of a club that would have me as a member. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that harks back to the old. Um, you ever hear the Hunter S. Thompson interview? 
So. Uh, oh, I, I think I know. Yeah. He um, he reported. Uh, so he he didn't like this um, political figure in like Michigan, mm-hmm. and uh, he reported that there was a rumor that the senator or whatever governor I forget really who it was uh, was addicted to ibogaine, and so. Ibogaine was like a speed form of speed from like Africa. Okay. And so he's on this television interview in the 70s, and the guy's like, you reported that uh, so-and-so was addicted to Ibogaine. He goes, well, you see, I could report on that rumor because I started the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> so the rumor was true because he started the rumor. <laughs> That's the whole gonzo journalism. Like, journalism yeah. is what you're supposed to not put yourself into the story right. at all. And then the first piece of gonzo journalism that was ever made was the Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved. <laughs> and he was he was being sent by, I think it was like Rolling Stone, it was like some sports magazine or Rolling yeah, Stone. Yeah, he, was, he started as a sports writer. And yeah. and he was supposed to go cover the Kentucky Derby. And they, they're bringing in this illustrator from, from England, Ralph Steadman, <laughs> who's a good little boy, he's never done a drug in his life. <laughs> Hunter S. Thompson picks him up from the airport and immediately doses him on acid. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved. Is instead of him watching the horse race, he's, he's watching, he's, he's watching this guy. <laughs> he, he's, no, he's like describing the Kentucky turno- colonels like puking on himself. <laughs> he goes to the Pendennis Club in Louisville and that's where like the old fashioned was invented. Yeah. And, and I thought it was the mint julep. That, was that might have been invented there too. The, the, the old fashioned w- was probably actually invented in New York, in Manhattan, but it's attributed to there was a bartender at the Pendennis Club that made a drink for a Kentucky general, uh, for a general from the Confederacy. And the reason why it was called the old fashioned is because whiskey used to be, you know, worse quality back then, and they would naturally like sweeten it with mm-hmm. water and juice when, mm-hmm. ju- when juice may become like more readily available. So by the time it was established as a drink, it was already an old drink. Drink. <laughs> yeah, and then it, the Manhattan was made in Manhattan, and then the, every other fucking cocktail was made in San Francisco. <laughs> Most, a lot of cocktails were invented in San Francisco because of the gold rush. I thought a lot of them came from the uh, the uh, uh, prohibition. It's like you you had a bunch of really bad booze being made, and so to- you had to you had to throw some shit in there to make it palatable. That, that was the story that, that I always picked up on. I think that's one of the reasons why, like, pre-Prohibition bourbon is valued the way it is, because it was, like, if you had good bourbon before you had to make it not taste good, or mm. make it taste... Repeal batches. Yeah. Anyway. What were we talking about? Well, we were talking about uh, religion and... Well, not really religion, I but had, the effect of, of being in church. I had no idea that you were... Uh, and then, yeah. That... For lack of a better phrase, right now, that into God. At um, one point, he was. Yeah, yeah I, that was never something that I ever knew about. Yeah. I um, I would describe the process of like leaving, like a relationship with Jesus, as being traumatizing. I can believe that. It's. It's like ending a relationship with someone that you actively still love. Like, like you are leaving the relationship, mm-hmm. and it's like I don't know. And why did you do it? Just I just I guess it's in the same way that like sometimes well when I'll if when I'll pray nowadays if I do pray I I get this sensation of reaching out to something outside myself. Mm-hmm. In the same way I think that when I left the idea of Jesus I realized that the projection of Jesus that I was talking to wasn't real. Okay. I mean, it sounds like you just didn't feel it. It was more like I realized I was talking to myself the whole time. Hmm. Like, it's almost like finding an email account with every email you've ever sent and they were all sent to yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. And just like, I'm not going to go through that whole inbox, but I know <laughs> what every one of those emails says. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't know if that's a way to describe it. I, I was talking to you about Zen earlier and how like, you know, I'm always going to, my brain's always going to come up with some new scheme, some new plot, some new prank, like some new idea. But like, I'm, I'm happier when I do less. And I don't know where, it, it, there's a lot of things that go into that. I read, have you ever read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink? No. So he talks about how like the brain's a computer, is a processor. Mm-hmm. Like you're already, it's, it, 
you can like try to sit down and think about something and be like, well, how do I feel about this cigarette? Is it a cigar? Is it a cigarette? Is it brown? Is it? But you look at it and you already know all those things. You don't need to put words on it. So like in the beginning of the book, he talks about there's this statue and they're doing all these tests on the statue. It's so like, you know, what type of stone is it made out of the art? style from what period and they found it in Italy and it was discovered in the 20s but was it like you know we wanted to know if it was a, a, a fake or if it was a real artifact and they tested for weeks and weeks and weeks the patina uh, you know the aging process like all these different things and then after like weeks and weeks of these tests they brought in experts and the expert would look at it and be like it's fake because <laughs> It, it, you didn't need to do any tests on it because like this doesn't add up with that. It just you, they, you know instantly in a blink of an eye when you develop that expertise. Yeah, and and so like the brain works in, this, in a similar way, and I think my brain especially works in that way, where like I I can't I can't just sit down and be like I want to write a song about this plate. Like I can't do that. Like I'll look at the plate and hear words in my head. Or like I'll say something funny and I'll hear somebody laughing and if I have a conscious moment to like reflect on it I'll be like be like that was interesting but like I didn't come up with that I heard it and I said it like it was funny so I said it like did I write that no is it from some divine frequency I don't know what are thoughts like it sounds like you're going hoe over there I thought mm. it, it, so, it sounds like you're talking about that like the, the adage and I think it was I think it was young I think it was young that said uh, you don't have thoughts thoughts have you I think this is one of the reasons why like when I got hooked on your guys podcast I was like dying to get on it is <laughs> because it's like you guys have been trained and this is also goes back into that doing less it's because it's like I'm an old dog like I'm not my I'm past the point where of development and and I have drank and done a number of drugs in my life so like I, I have experienced cognitive decline at 33 I know for a fact that I either was smarter 10 years ago or I've always been dumber than I thought I was <laughs> yeah, I go back and forth and, and I feel like I'm actually better now wait, about him or yourself about, my, hey. <laughs> about myself um, I figured the audience needed clarification yes yeah. no uh, I don't know, and I don't, I don't think that I'm that I come down on myself for that. I think that it's it's a humbling experience because regardless of whether of how smart I actually might be, you know. Okay, so like they tested my brother and I when I was a kid, and I think they told me I was like IQ 130 something, and it's like, what does that mean? Like, it means you have pretty good pattern recognition skills. Cool. <laughs> I mean, most of IQ tests is pattern recognition. Right. For better or worse, that's how we decide to classify and quantify intelligence. Yeah, and it's like, I'm, I don't think I'm going to get any smarter. And I, I don't think I'm going to get any smarter than I am now. And I possibly was smarter before. So, like, I've, it's like that looking at your quality of life and thinking, like, yeah, I could have more money. I could have love and relationships. But, like, it's only going to go downhill. I can't help I have, but come back to that thought every now and again, and it's and it's troubling because I don't want to think that thought, but it exists. I have never been in that 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 headspace where okay, everything's just going to go downhill from here. It might be a slow decline. No, I've always been rather optimistic about my prospects, probably overly so. I mean, well, I started this thing. <laughs> true. Well, I I think actually, when you saying that, I think there was a point where. That I think a lot of people get to when you know you you you'd been married, you just had your son, and you had a house. And I got the feeling that there at the beginning, you started getting that feeling like, okay, I've done these things. What the hell am I going to do now? Is this the rest of my life? And you were, I think, the arbitrarium was part of pushing yourself past. Maybe that. you might be onto something there. And that's not. That's like that. That's not like a. a, a I didn't think. I didn't take it as a judgment or. Right. A, um, and, and I, I think it's normal. I don't mean that it's only going to go down. Like, I just mean that eventually it's going to go back down. Like, I don't know. Well, yeah, but I mean, you could you could go on. You would never get. You would never accomplish anything if that was like the sole thought that you had. Like, I'm going to die someday. So yeah. What the fuck? But I don't know. It's like you know, I I started my podcast and then I haven't done it for a month. Like I told you that they tested me for ADHD when I was young. And the only thing I was ever told is like years after it, I asked my mom. I was like. I was like, so I'm not, I'm not ADHD. I was like, well, what did they tell you? She was like, 
Ah, you have a slight perfectionism. It's like if you can't do something the way you want to do it or you think it needs to be done, you like lose the energy to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. It's like, why did you tell me that before? <laughs> and then why have you ever been mad at me for not doing, I don't know. It's almost like, so if you knew that, then anytime you've ever been mad at me for something, it's been on you, like, like not on me. I don't know. I think my parents were bad teachers. And my mom taught Sunday school. So you, I didn't even know your mom taught Sunday school. Mm -hmm. From what I've heard of your mom, it doesn't surprise me. I think I've only met her once. I Maybe. love my mom, but her name is Karen. Mm. Bad time to be a Karen. Yeah. <laughs> It was the strangest thing was it was me, my dad, and my mom watching, and she had Fox News on, and they started talking about the Karen thing, and I was just kind of like side eyeing her. <laughs> and she like didn't say a word, <laughs> didn't say a word, and and it was almost like her, I, like I watched her brain like run on silent, <laughs> like like if you go like, silent, go deep, like like you like a computer that that's like brand new, like you, like you know it's on, but like you could barely so hear the fan. Yeah. I was just like. I was like, how did she just do that? Like, <laughs> this is the most mentally quiet I think my mom has ever been in. Because I get uh, every neurotic thing about me, I get from her. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you know my parents. Oh yes, yes I do. And uh, the neuroticism from your mom. In so far as you have a temper, it comes from your dad. I think I think your brother is definitely more on those lines. I do have a temper, but it usually comes out in a comedic way. If I'm like actually upset, and she's one of the only people that knows how to make me like physically upset. I don't know if you've ever seen me like react angrily, like actually. Only once. What? What, like, what was? I your... don't remember the exact circumstances. I know that we were both living at that at, at the house at, at the time, and I was uh, and and she said something to you about. It might have had something to do with laundry. It was something. It was something innocuous, but when you reacted, it was like there's more to this than laundry, at least for Matt. And it sounds like for Karen too. So the the one time that I can remember is, is I'm on the, on the sitting on the uh, we're arguing about something, and this is this is six months after my, one of my best friends in the world, Jordan, got killed. Mm. And so Jordan got shot. And this, and August first will be the 10 year an anniversary of this. Actually, I remember you telling me about this? He was he was a small group of people decided to trip on mushrooms, and somebody's supposed to be trip sitting them, and then she got guilt tripped away from from that by her boyfriend, who was like, "Are you their mom or are you my girlfriend?" So he, she was like, oh, God, "So." He started having anxiety and like couldn't find her and then like started thinking of his mom who he always had a really good relationship with his parents and he just started having anxiety and it was summer and he was hot and so he would never wear a shirt even when he drove and he left the house tripping on mushrooms wearing just pants and boxers no shoes no cell phone no wallet and got chased by these people who thought he was like a crackhead because mm -hmm. he was like fucked up and lost and wandered into the back of the wrong house and this lady shot him in the head tripping on mushrooms and so like my parents are aware of the fact that we all like to party and you know he got killed by that my mom and I are arguing about something and she and she of course you know doesn't can't lose an argument so she one of these people where she just starts to bring up some area where mm -hmm. you're wrong or where she's got dirt on you and she she said well look what happened to Jordan and this was like six months after it happened and I don't know how I, it, I moved so fast there were these like plastic things on the countertop that were like something like led to like an inflatable bed or something random and I just grabbed it and smashed it on the countertop and my mom went like dead quiet and my dad comes in the room and he was just like look what's going on here <laughs> and he sees that I broke something but then, he, but then he finds out that she like referenced my dead friend and was just like you shouldn't have done that don't break things but you should not have, <laughs> have done that um, yeah but August 1st would be the 10 year reunion anniversary anniversary of that. I also have some PTSD from that. That's um that has been consistently a problematic conversation. Yeah. There you go. Go get a drink real quick. Cool. Hey. Uh we might let hang on a sec. Let's uh we might be able to do a break, get another drink and yeah, twenty three, that works. I was just gonna get some water, I don't need another coffee. Okay. I'll hey. take a break anyway. Taking a break, coming back. Did someone walk through your yard? Have you misplaced your lounge slippers again? Don't worry, we're on the case. One call puts the most thorough investigation imaginable to solving your most trivial of quandaries. Our testimonials speak for themselves. I was paying my bills then got up to use the restroom. When I came back, my pen was missing. 
I called Everyday Investigations and they immediately took the case. In a matter of hours, they ripped my floorboards and tested each strand of carpet for DNA. They even swept my whole house with a Geiger counter. They found my pen was in my own pocket after a rough cavity search and interrogation. And it only cost me $8,000 for the investigation and contract repairs. Thanks, Everyday Investigations. Don't shrug it off. Solve your mysteries today. Everyday Investigations. You deserve to know. And welcome back. There are no rules. I'm, I'm saying that twice. We're discussing very personal things. PTSD and philosophy and everything else. All right, so I just mentioned Khalil Gibran saying the passion and reason rudder and, and sail. sail thing. There's an idea in Zen or in uh, Buddhism in, in general, they use the chariot and horses. Like, you know, you tighten up too much in the reins, the chariot doesn't go anywhere. You let the reins out too loose, the horses run wild. Yeah. You have to, like, strike a balance. Mm -hmm. And, like, I... It's been hard to stay balanced without, like proper like social grounding and I feel like you know you were always that for me like <laughs> you know and he's specifically referencing Dave well yeah well I, I would say but but like you've become that like I mean so, so is Noah like even though I haven't like I that's a big thing I, I've regretted that like you know I've known the man for like 20 years now well I'm not like 15 years I met you met him after high school right yeah yeah it's about 15 years and, and it's just like with my cousins. We're like, if I put the time together over the course of these years, like there's not a lot of time there, even though I consider him to be a close friend. And it's like, that is, is it, people say not to live with regrets, but like, if I do regret something, it's those kind of things that I regret. Like, you know. If anybody tells you not to have regrets, don't listen to that person. Yeah. <laughs> like absolutely fucking atrocious. The way I the way I think about regrets is it's like it's sticking your hand on the stove. Yes, it hurts like a motherfucker, but it's also a good lesson. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that in the first place. You should regret doing it. Exactly. Um, anyone who goes through life without some measure of regret hasn't lived life passionately enough, hasn't hasn't made the mistakes that everyone should make. Is this well, soccer? they is might this? have because you end up like, and I'm going to go ahead and name drop here because we had a conversation about it. You end up like out there. The regrets mount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They stack up on each other and eventually. Well, I remember him. You got nowhere to go. Like recently, even saying that, like, on like the on Facebook, he said something about being like, I used to be such a social person, and like now, yeah. some days I like. like I'm afraid he's he said he was, he was afraid to start new relationships. Like he had his wife has to like help him. Yeah, that was around the time that he came to Indianapolis and me and him hung out. Uh, I've got my own that feelings kind of on that one, but that's more <laughs> more personal. Yes, we talked about. I, that I'd go into a rant there, and I'm I'm going to stop before <laughs> like that gets started. But yeah, I mean, it's like I think the position that I I'm, I'm discovering that I play in a lot of people's lives is like. One that I didn't even realize myself until recently, like how much it was. I think I think I'm. I realized recently that like that world that you've always wanted to be out there, like even from the time you were a kid, like as you grow up and people piss you off and life sucks and all this other bad shit happens to you. You're you always to, waiting for it to happen. You get to a point where it's like that world is bullshit, and you start getting jaded and all that shit. But it, it's it's not like that world actually is there even if you're not engaging in it. Like, like the it's idea been of there love. the whole time. Like the idea of love. Like, especially being a single person, you're thinking like, like you're married. Like, there was a time when you were like, is it ever going to fucking happen to me? Like, oh yeah. Do you feel like that's like a similar thing? Oh, with relationships right now, yeah. I'm definitely feeling that. It's, it's been rough. And now, you know, Brittany moved out recently, so that's made, made matters worse. But... Because even if I wasn't, you know, in a relationship with Brittany for five years, having a roommate was, you know, I always had someone to talk to, someone that I could have dinner with and watch TV or whatever. Now, Alexa, what's the weather like? Yeah. Now I live with a cat, two cats and a robot. Master. Which off. sounds a lot cooler than it is. You have two cats still? Yeah, Brittany hasn't taken Corey yet. She's waiting until uh, she gets her apartment set up. Two cats and a robot. Sounds like a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to ruin that robot. Or or an, <laughs> or an episode of Black Mirror. Yeah, God, I, I I don't I don't actively seek that show out because it disturbs me so much. Like the one where they made the like copy of the girl, 
and then she realizes she is the copy. I thought about that. I'm still thinking about it, mm -hmm. and it upsets me. Yeah, that actually does kind of go back to what I was talking about, like the stabilize, like being the stabilizing agent. Yeah. For people, like, cause I never really saw myself that way. Like, I knew that, like, my family kind of felt that way about me. But as far as other people, I didn't feel like I was like. And even now, I don't really feel like I'm, I'm like that important to people in that regard. Well, and I think that's part of how it works more effectively. Like, you're not going around trying to save people. Like, you not come anymore. To, well, <laughs> yeah, not anymore. No, but I mean, but you're. Like, like coming to town this weekend, like, like you know, I could have, I don't know, it, you, you didn't come to town to, like, get me out of a rut, but I was like, now that I'm, like, you know, reflecting on my behavior over the past couple of weeks, it's like, I was in a rut, like, <laughs> I was in a fucking rut, and I was just rutting along, like, like, this is fine, this is fine. It's like that dog. In the fire, yeah. In the fire. Yeah. The table. <laughs> this is fine. This is fine. This is no, and it's not like um, uh, what was it? Socrates said the the, the unexamined life is a life it's not, not worth living. Yeah, uh, you were talking uh, about don't. It's either Socrates or Aristotle. Plato never would have said something like that. <laughs> well, um, you were talking about don't trust somebody who says don't have regrets. Yeah, and I think about like the people that I know that it's it's everyone in my active life, like my coworkers, my parents, like. Those are the kind of people that think, like, they think like that. R mm -hmm. Whether they know it or not, they they think that you should be good, do the good things, follow the laws, get the job, pay the mortgage, like, do check off the boxes. My dad's always like, check off the boxes, mm -hmm. but it's like, I don't know where I'm going with this. Well, I mean, like that. There's a balance you have to strike with that because that's actually not bad advice if you contextualize it properly. Like, checking off the boxes is good advice because you do want to have like this is the thing I need to do, and then you do it, and you feel better about your life. Well, you, 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 I, the, guess, I guess what I mean is that it seems like all these people have the same list of boxes. Oh, wow. And, and the people like you and you, who I can talk to intellectually and about anything, is because we choose what boxes yes. go on that list. Mm -hmm. My like, boxes are very different. Garrett's boxes are hexagons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All hail the holy hexagon. I think mine are all different shapes. <laughs> Mine's yeah. like a scantron of the different, like the put I was the. Thinking you're like, like a toddler with the blocks. Yeah, right yeah. <laughs> Showing to put the the star in the circle. I, I got it. There's a uh, there's an old story about uh, the Chinese military academy. That um, their great TV show, by the way. Their their entrance exam is you take you take circles or you take different shapes and you push them put them in, in wooden blocks. Yep. And if you get all of them through there, then you become an officer. So you have two kinds of officers in the Chinese military. Those who are moderately intelligent and those who are incredibly strong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great. <laughs> oh, man. That's like, there's a word for that type of joke with a short stop at the end. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, we were out west, and this guy was talking about, like, have you never been in bear country before, have you? And I was like, no. He goes, well, first of all, never hike alone. If you do hike, you need to wear things on you that make noise so that it scares the bears off, like, you know, bells and shit, right? And the second thing is, you need to know the difference between black bear dung and grizzly bear dung. And I was like, really? Why? Because he says, see, uh, black bear dung has little tiny seeds in it, right? And uh, grizzly dung has little bells. <laughs> 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 From what I know of bears, it's the it's the opposite. If you run into a, a brown bear or a grizzly, it's you know back away slowly, don't 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 try and run or anything like that. If you run into a black bear, it's because it's actively hunting you. Well, and and the I think the downside that I I read somewhere recently is that if you run into a bear police officer and they tell you to put your hands up, they immediately get confused because they don't know how you got so big. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, buddy! <laughs> oh God! Yeah, the, there was something I wanted to say. I forgot. It's all good. I have a way of derailing people. Yeah. Well, this is the arbitrarium. It comes with the territory. We don't so much have a track as it's uh, 
Have you ever seen a train leave the track and then keep trying to sputter around in the mud and then eventually like fall over? That's kind of the Arbitrarium. It's spectacular, but it goes nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Except the one time it did. The one time it did, and it shall go down in the Arbitrarium history as we actually came up with a fucking answer. <laughs> oh yeah, what was that? Human. That was... What is? Well, How what do... was the answer? Um, what, what defines a human is is, is rationality and thinking. how 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 does it how does someone how, do, how does a being think I so now I I think that the arbitrarium needs to get like a glossary together because there's a list of terms that you guys reference all the time like that it's like this is very poignant and, and this is like wheelhouse like this is your wheelhouse like what's the sentience sapiens, oh, sapiens, sapiens sentience and sentience consciousness and yeah, like logic that. uh we try to define the terms. I try to make sure that we do that when we use words that people may not be familiar with. But it's getting to the point where, like, like in a fantasy novel, you've got the list of, like, this character is from here in the back of the book. You've oh, got yeah. a list of, like, the Arbitrarium is forming its own glossary of, like, <laughs> sapience, sentience, there it is again, Hitler. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Gonna add one more to the fucking count. You should never have told him about this. Oh, <laughs> uh, I I knew I already knew it was gonna be a thing. <laughs> you, you can't be a person like us and not because we we discuss philosophy, politics, people, and, and what are the like What's major the, the major fascists of the twentieth century were all people that like abused ethics, of politics, people like they, they did the they did Everything that you shouldn't do, like uh, uh, Mussolini, like oh, uh, strong man. Like we're, uh, t I love the phrase "time is a flat circle" because mm. it's just like, how do we deal with this? Just look at it, how they dealt with it before. Like there was a professor, so my, this guy I listened to, his history professor was like, if you ever want to look at history and think like, how would a person behave or how would a person act, just think about what you would do. Like we have, uh, there's a mummified, there's a body of a man masturbating in Pompeii next to <laughs> dick artwork on the walls. Like, you can romanticize antiquity all you want. There are a bunch of fucking people. We yeah. haven't changed since we evolved into humans. Like, yeah, we, we're, we're operating with uh, a caveman hardware. You know, hardware that's arguably 350,000 years old that was designed to do a specific task, survive under certain circumstances. The, the software gets updated every generation or so, but there, you, there's only so far the hardware itself can go, to, to use the computer analogy for the human brain. You were making an argument about evolution and about whether the, the technology, uh, like ha we haven't evolved to deal with the amount of information that we're processing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what do we need, what needs to happen for that to... I forget what was the argument. Uh, yeah, I do too. Was what do we need we're... to do in order to... I feel like we're jumping into transhumanism territory here. Like, a little bit. We're going that direction. We need, we need to change ourselves so that we can handle what we're capable of. We have to update our hardware yeah. because our software has changed and our hardware can't deal with it. Right, there's only so much you can do with the software there as far as you know, ideology, way of thinking. Um, yeah. If you were to make an analogy, would this be like trying to run Photoshop on a Windows 95? Um... You could do it if it was the right Photoshop. I was going to say it's more like... Because, I mean, people still function I mean, relatively well. Barely. Uh, everyone has their neuroses, everyone has their problems, yeah, but that's been around as, as long as human beings have. But the world is becoming far more complicated. There's far more different ways to interact. Different. There's information being thrown at you that you've never needed, that humans have never needed to, to deal with before. I, I personally am optimistic and think we're up to the challenge, but... Um, we would have never met Steve today if cars didn't exist. Right. That's a story for another time. <laughs> I've met three Steves this, over the past 12 hours. Beware three Steves. It's like the, co the, the cock crows three times before. <laughs> I remember what I was going to say. All right, the, going back to the way back to the checked hexagons or boxes or uh, some sort of what 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 is what is the 2D shape thing? There's a word for it in math. What do you mean the 2D shape? Square. I mean, you get, a square is one of any kind any kind of 2D shape. Poly. A polygon. 
polygon. I thought a polygon was three dimensional. No, okay, polygon. Okay, polygon. Yeah. Um, whatever, whatever polygon you're checking off. Geometric on your list, shape. It's most of those boxes that you need to check off are are things that you voluntarily enter into. Like, yeah, you you, you having play, kids, going to college, getting yeah, a car. These these are. These are things that you, you take responsibility for. Well, I mean, if you only had one biological imperative, and it's reproduced, right? Like, uh, arguably yes, but there's there's been plenty of people who haven't reproduced. This is true. That's why it's called the biological imperative. Right. And so I guess if you want your civilization to keep going. It should be a civilizational imperative as well. Well, that's a philosophical imperative. No, the philosophical uh, imperative is the categorical imperative. How many imperatives are there? Many. Which it's one's important that you know this. Which one's the most important? I would say the categorical imperative. So you know how to order them. So it's the table of context. Table of contents in the front of the book. It's the table oh, of context. Yeah, I was going to say, I like table of context better. <laughs> Thank you, Kant. <laughs> I uh, learned about Kant in the humanities program. The only thing I can remember is no, an <laughs> auditorium full of people giggling every time the professor said Kant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the only thing. He, he, was, he was such a, he was a little old man who, who they brought in to lecture about philosophy, and he, you could barely hear him. You could only hear the one word, and we were all a bunch of children. <laughs> <laughs> With laptops and internet. I need to read more Kant. Right. Good luck. Uh, good luck. It's, it's yeah, hard. I've, I've, Laborious. It's very difficult. I've got a PDF that I've been picking at. I own a, a copy of... Picks at a, Pizza crust. Yeah, I own a copy of a Critique of Pure Reason, and that's the one I have. It takes it takes me several days to get through, you know, like two pages. I'm thinking that if I if I actually learned German in its entirety, it'd probably be easier to read. But um, the 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 thing that always sticks to, sticks out to me about Kant is his uh, the Critique of Pure Reason and. Empiricism, rationality, they're not mutually exclusive. You you guys can get along just fine. Bury the hatchet, because this is a stupid argument. <laughs> yeah. I look at Kant as like the Jeff Beck of philosophers. He's a philosopher's philosopher. He's not your oh, everyday, okay. like, the Jeff Beck. He's a musician's musician. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a musician, so I like Jeff Beck. But if I, like, went to Becky, who's was like, hey, name me a Jeff Beck song, she'd be like, who? You know, one of the guitar players from the Yardbirds? Mm. Woman? <laughs> <laughs> you know, played with Jimmy Page? And, 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 okay. Fuck yeah, me, yeah, I mean, that's... He, I, guess, I, I suppose that's true. He is the philosopher's philosopher because there's so much you need to know, to know before you can tackle God. Yeah, he builds upon so many things that came before him. Mm. That's, that's why I like philosophy. One of the reasons I like philosophy, anyway, is that you, you can engage in a... 4,000 year old conversation and you still might have something meaningful to contribute. Mm -hmm. And so like almost every philosopher that came after Kant drew on Kant mm -hmm. in what, one way or another. What time period was he? Uh, was he Germany? Like 1600s? Early 1800s. 1800s. Yeah, early 1800s in Germany. And now, uh, if you were, as a layman, which I think Defender we all of the night technically are. Yes. <laughs> um... Layman, defender of the fighter of the stand man. <laughs> um, how would you describe Kant? I mean, in the little I've managed to understand Kant, in the little I've managed to read. Um, like, if we were to be like, somebody walks up and say Kant and be like, oh, Kant is. I usually think of his categorical imperative. There's two things I think of. I think of the categorical imperative, which was, to, as far as I'm to understand, it was his way of trying to create a, a system of. A, a secular system of morality. So when you guys were talking about philosophy, you say, does it always go back to Descartes? And then people build on Descartes? So Kant would be, all right, we already know the Not everybody builds thing. off of Descartes. I mean, like... Descartes? If, they're, if they're following in the Enlightenment tradition of philosophy, you kind of have to start at Descartes. Right. Well, I'm, well, I'm thinking specifically with, like, the phenomenologists in the mid-20th century, like Sartre and de Beauvoir mm -hmm. and all them. They... They so well actually even more so like Heidegger. Well, so Heidegger. I, I, went, I went through the philosophies program and like if you study art or music or anything that humans have done, it's all got lineages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Egon Schiele studied under Gustav Klimt, who studied under mm -hmm. so it's you know it's yeah. like so so who did Kant build off of? Uh, Kant built off of Hume. 
Yeah, Hume and, and what did Hume teach? Hume Hume built off of uh, Plato? No, no. Hume built um, off that of that part's fuzzy uh, for that's me. That's a big jump. Hume built off Voltaire. Voltaire built yeah, off Descartes. Bit, right. Descartes built off of the. Um, the car was somewhat foundational, though, because he broke everything down. Yes, but well, he, Plato did that too. I, I'd say, I'd say, Descartes or Descartes, he 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 built off of via deconstruction yeah. of um, medieval high scholasticism, which was combining Christian theology with classical philosophy and trying to figure how can you know how to square that circle, mm -hmm. and so you, that. The biggest contributor to that one was uh, Thomas, Thomas Aquinas. He built off of St. Augustine. St. Augustine built off of classical, I mean, a bunch of Roman philosophers, which was built off Greek philosophy, which in some way, shape, or form can go back to Socrates. Yeah. Socrates is kind of the foundation of Western philosophy. Right. You, can't, you can go further back, but prior to that, it was... Starts with a Z. What the hell? Hammurabi. Is that's legalism. Yeah, that's more legalism. Hammurabi was more legalism, and well, legalism now, to be can, fair, be can be summed up with "fuck you, follow the law." <laughs> is is Hammurabi older than the Epic yes. of Gilgamesh? Oh, oh no, 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 no! It's not old, ever older than the Epic of Gilgamesh. I thought you were going to say older than um, Socrates. Yeah, but no, it's not. Well, I was going to say because I mean, if you read like. Uh, Old, I mean, like, isn't the Epic of Gilgamesh one of the earliest stories? It is the oldest Oldest. recorded, written down story. And wouldn't you say that there's like morals? And Very much so. Um, so maybe the biggest the biggest thing that I can pull from uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh is Bros Before Hoes. I mean, you got you got Gilgamesh and Enkidu, and it starts with a fucking wrestling match, and then you're like, you know what? You're fucking cool. I think you're fucking cool. Let's go paint the town red. So they went whoring for three days. <laughs> and by whoring, it, it took Inkadu and turned him from this wild man into a civilized dude, which I think is just fascinating. Because it's engaging with the opposite sex, you have to become more civilized. So it, just all, that is such a thick concept. Well, the and idea of a woman as a civilizing agent is not a new one at all. Yeah. I mean, also, weirdly, the opposite is also considered you know, women as being something uh, representative of nature and chaos and all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, which one is it? Which well, one is it? It's both. <laughs> In some way, it's, it, it, it depends on what, what angle are you attacking this from. I read somewhere, I don't remember what this book was, but they were talking about how like people always go back and forth about like matriarchal, matriarchal versus patriarchal societies and like ultimately partnership societies are the best ones because mm -hmm. it's it, people have on an equal footing, but because we are in a patriarchal society, it's constantly shifting back and forth. Like there's either patriarchies or matriarchies. There's no, there, we don't really have. Um, there, there aren't very many examples of partnership societies like still su surviving mm -hmm. in like our modern day. I mean, arguably, arguably, uh, the the societies that have actually prosper, prospered post enlightenment have been in their own way partnership societies. And uh, in, instead of everyone being treated as equal across all things because you're never going to run across a society that can actually pull that off because people aren't clones. Um, it's, it's division of labor is, is a better way to think about that. Both jobs are equally important. Well, that's why people started farming in the first place, is because they realized, oh, if I toss these seeds here, that same plant grows there, and then they start doing that all the time, then you have to start communities to divide the labor up. Yeah, you know, you, you plant the food, and that means you, you, you own the food, and everyone wants to be your friend, and you get a bigger house than everybody. Um, and what well, starts off with you, uh, you have to develop systems of organizing the food and trading for the food. You you can't just work off a barter system. Well, we got to have a, 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 a holder of value, a medium of exchange. And we got to go, go back further because there's there's the uh, thing that ferments and then makes you feel funny. And oh, I like that. Yeah, I want that to keep happening. Did we discover 
intoxicants before we started civilization? There I think is a theory. Did. There is a theory called the stoned ape theory. Yep. Yes, Terence yep. McKenna. <laughs> which uh, I've not read much into, but I I read because I can't I can't take it seriously, even I, though I know it's a legitimate theory. I I actually read I read all of Food of the Gods, so I am actually you can actually, yeah, you can ask me a question this time. <laughs> no, his whole his whole theory goes back to like, you know in Africa where shrooms originate on cow dung when monkeys came down from the trees and they started like eating these mushrooms it gave them the like your your eyes dilate you see things more clearly like it made them better hunters like he goes into a bunch of different theories like uh, do you know where Christmas comes from? Uh, I, I thought it was a uh, Norse pagan kind of like Russia Eastern Europe mm -hmm. and in that part of the country there are little like you know the stereotypical cartoon mushroom yes amunita muscara which is the yeah. red and white ones mm -hmm. and uh i hear you double in height if you jump on one of those yeah yeah double jump no so look at Chris christmas as a culture you've got bright shiny things outside <laughs> man dressed in bright with colors with flying <laughs> reindeer like yeah if you're tripping on mushrooms flying through the woods things are going to be glowing like there's, there's a, everything he I just he, feel like there's a giant chunk of history missing in that explanation. <laughs> exactly. So all of Food of the Gods is him looking at society and civilization and attributing all of the changes to drugs. Like alcohol, tobacco, mushrooms. Like we started farming because we wanted more wheat for alcohol. Like wolves that hung around humans were originally gluten couldn't process gluten and right. the ones that could eventually became dogs. It's like he, he goes back to Gilgrepi Tepe and looks like there's a, a cow cult and mm -hmm. he, he ties that into well mushrooms grew on cow turds which goes back to the <laughs> Africa stone ape. Yeah. You know, like, I feel like this guy really really could use a, a lesson in correlation does not equal causation. He would tour like so him and his brother wrote the, under pseudonyms in the 60s mm -hmm. the magic mushroom growers guide the famous book that taught everyone how to grow magic mushrooms and then later they both became ethnobotanists and he it, they eventually people found out that they were the ones who wrote it but they wrote it in the 60s but after being a counterculture figure through the 60s and 70s he eventually in like the 90s would like tour raves and give these long like philosophical speeches to these kids while they're all like rolling like they've, they've still got like uh, long videos of them on the internet and people put them to like mm -hmm. music but before he died he was like he had a, a place out in um hawaii and it pretty much like his, his garden was like every cycle every psychedelic <laughs> drug known to man like wild person yeah, he seems like I'm listening to all this, and I haven't read the book, but he seems to me like one of those people that like got into the culture and went fucking nuts with it. Very woo woo. Yes. Woo woo. <laughs> woo woo is fun. It, it, it's fun to contemplate. It's fun to talk about. I've heard this term a lot lately. So back when my art school days, when I hung out with people, you knew them. Oh yeah. So we knew lots of people. They were all pseudo hippies, mm -hmm. you know, like hanging out in the grass, smoking pot like trying mushrooms and shrooms and going to raves like I was in this apartment one time that we used to all party in and there were two friends of ours who I will not name who were having a deep it sounded like a deep philosophical conversation like they're just talking about like the world man and like mm. people and I was just like listen for a second and in my brain I just imagined a kid digging to China with a <laughs> sand shovel <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right and now, if you're gonna do that, you want to use a mass driver, but oh, but that's what that's how a lot of like a lot of really positive, beautiful people who like want peace for the world, like not firing on all cylinders. Yeah, I was I was struck that that kind of people those kind of people always struck me as somewhat naive. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Like I don't want to hurt people. But at the same time, like violence has a place. Yes, it does in our society. Oh, I would love to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, I have thought about that for so long. I mean, I, I was raised. I've been shooting since uh, for 30 years, and I'm only 33. I've only shot one gun in my life. It was a 22 caliber rifle. It's not anything to write home about. I mean, I, my first shot I ever took was with a 22 caliber rifle, and my uncle, who was the one who taught me how to shoot, wanted to make sure that I respected firearms. So he shot you in the foot. No, <laughs> no. What he did 
was even more traumatic for a three-year-old. Oh, God. Um, he shot an animal. No. He found the most realistic, lifelike doll he could find and then filled it with big red soda. Holy and shook it up shit! You're... And then had me pull the trigger this on This is it. your uncle? Yes. Is he still alive? Can yes. I eat him? Yeah, you oh, can. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he sounds like was... a mad bastard. <laughs> Is this like the live-action Doc Martin from Back to the Future? <laughs> like Doc Martin, that's Doc, like Doc Martin, Doc yeah. Martin, the shoe guy, the shoe guy, you know. I was thinking, Doc you know, Brown. going to my Doc uncle's Brown. house, opening the door, and just a sandal. <laughs> okay, so he got a life-size doll and filled it with red soda. And you gotta kill the baby, buddy. And had me pull the trigger. You gotta kill the baby. And uh, I still remember that. Was alcohol involved? No. No, my. Firearms and alcohol do not mix in my family. No, no, but this man sounds like my spirit animal. <laughs> you think that till you meet him. Yeah. But uh, uh, would we not get along? No offense, Jeff. I like Jeff. He's a funny guy. But you he, get him, ro you get him rolling on politics or, or that uh, kind of stuff. It's like he, he will. Okay. He's very good at trapping you in a conversation. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you leave any urban center in the Midwest and you get country real quick. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you're in Ohio, mm. Indiana. He's lived in Indianapolis his whole life. I actually grew up in Fountain Square. Yeah. Well, your family has also lived in mostly urban environments in their little country. Yeah, yeah, they grew up in Mars Hill. Mars Hill mostly, that <laughs> general area. Yeah. There's a Mars Hill <laughs> in every city. Is there really? Remember we found Mars Hill in Atlanta? Atlanta, yeah. Well, that's, maybe that's I'm just two. making an assumption. That's two okay, cities. So it's two. <laughs> it's like so I'm right, right? Dot, dot makes a line. <laughs> yeah, you follow the line and... I got nothing. Find That's how we Mars got here Hill. in the first place. Yeah. We followed but, um, four yeah. of them, in fact. The problem was the other dot was me. <laughs> it's... So, I, I, I'm a Heinleinian in my political beliefs. A, a what now? Heinleinian. Hein... Robert Heinlein. Oh, I was going to say... My favorite book is Starship Troopers. I've read it 15 times. Okay, now. I've never seen... I've never read the book, but I love the mythology. Um, the movie is good if you watch the movie before you read the book. So I recommend that. That way you can enjoy them both. Well done. But um, That was easy. What's next? The, the political basis of the whole thing, they actually preserved fairly well. Is it futurism? No, that, it would not be futurism. That, that's straight science fiction. There's a difference. Um, but all of, all of civilization is based upon who can bring the most violence. Because it's not a it's not a comforting thing to think about. Well, it's like the sword is a superior weapon, but then if the sword comes up against gunfire, it's like, well, right. fuck me for learning all that <laughs> sword play. Like, right. Although the um, Carolians might disagree in some regards before the battle that they lost. Anyway, um, we'll unpack that in a different episode. Yes, we'll talk. We'll talk about Carolus Rex at some other point. Um, I think that was another trope that I, I forgot to bring up earlier. Is the the constant. <laughs> That's well, another branching, podcast. Yes. yes. But all, all of civilization is founded on who can bring the most violence. Because violence is the final arbiter of difference. There is nothing that goes beyond it. If, if there was, we would have no choice but to invest the state with that as well. So, uh, modern society, at least modern Western societies, are built off the idea that Okay, everyone has some sort of say in government and the state. Therefore, we have we each have a say in what is it acceptable to use violence to resolve, and in what way is should that violence be applied. That's where that comes from. That's how that that operates. Because you can talk about all you want of okay, the state does this wrong. These laws are unjust. We shouldn't follow this. But at the end of the day, someone with a gun is going to show up to make you, to, to coerce you to comply. It reminds me of the Ned Stark, uh, the man who cast the sentence, car uh, carries out the, the man who... The man who makes the judge, or who makes the judgment carries out the sentence. Yeah. Something along those lines. Well, is that, that's, that goes into, um, what's the word? Accountability. Yes. And it... This I keep looking at him all the time because I'm turned that way. Yeah. Oh, well, you guys are the ones talking. Right so the 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 basis of of Heinleinian politics is all right. You want to vote? Cool. You should be allowed to do that, but you have to earn your earn your vote. You have to earn your citizenship, and the reason is by by voting, 
you are exercising political authority. Political authority boils down to violence. So you want to exercise ultimate authority, that being the authority over life and death. What are you going to put up to earn it? So in order to earn that authority, you have to put up something of equal value. Your own life. It is the ultimate responsibility you can ever take for any one action. But well, we live in a society where our money is based on nothing and it's not backed by gold like like it used to be, but it, it's still based off of the, the know, invisible value system. The invisible value system yeah. of life, death, authority, and violence. Right. So, yeah, if, if you want to vote, put your life up for it. Service guarantees citizenship. Exactly. People say that is, that is like they, they say that's such a fascist thing. It is anti-fascist in, in the actual strictest sense. Mm. You're right. A, a fascist state is citizenship guarantees service, and the entire state is built to keep you serving. Mm. Service guarantees citizenship is no. If you want citizenship, you voluntarily take under the service, and it must be consistent consent. To complete your your term of service to gain your citizenship. If you if you decide, all right, I'm not this this isn't for me. There's no shame in it. All right, that's fine. You're still protected by a bill of rights. I know when I was reading about Plato's Republic, I, it kind of reminded me in some respects of that the idea of the philosopher king and all the things that the guy has to go through in order to earn the position. Well, it was also the things a, that you have to experience caste system. Yeah. But just have that, having the idea, like, people, whoever's going to be in this position needs to have experienced certain things so that they know, so that they appreciate the responsibility of it, which is something we definitely don't have in the U.S. See, the problem in that society is that it creates a hierarchy. So, like... Well, every society has a hierarchy, regardless of whether it's codified or not. And yeah, we, we it just leads those. to, like... Because you're going to have people that don't want to follow that system. Or that they're going to get people to disagree it's, that want a say without putting their life on the line. Yeah, and that's that's where the application of violence comes back in. It's like, all right, you want to say, here's how you get your say. You want your say, but you don't want to go through that. Okay, you don't get your say. Oh, you picked up a gun. We have bigger ones. What about, like, Quakers? Quakers? Uh, okay, so the, the concept of service to gain citizenship does you not can... necessarily have to be military. True. That is but one aspect, but it has to be something grueling and potentially lethal. <laughs> um, I don't know, testing survival gear in Antarctica. That would work. Mercury mining. <laughs> Community service in Detroit. <laughs> so, so we're going to recreate RoboCop. Well, for, we're not recreating it. We're just hoping that it exists so that it's relevant to our. This is a fairly neoclassicist idea. Yeah. Well, yeah. I definitely believe that, you know, regardless of whether you go into the military, you should. There should be a period of service. There will never be a system that isn't hierarchical. Yeah. By when you when you boil it down, because there's always going to be a situation where one person is more qualified than this or that. People people without even thinking about it create. Like, we value things. So we can't even think with, without valuing things. Is it weird for me to think that that, like, leads to slavery for some reason? It can, but it, that, it's, it, does, it doesn't always. If, if the system becomes too stratified and cal or calcified, you will end yeah. up with slavery. That's what I mean by that, because the, hi the hierarchy is the stratification. The hierarchy is inevitable. The corruption isn't necessarily inevitable. There's always going to be some level of corruption, but you can mitigate it with a proper system. Yeah, um... And there will I, I, always be hierarchies, which means there will always be corruption in that hierarchy, and so you build a system that mitigates the corruption within the hierarchy. That's the other side doing. of that. The, the service guarantees citizenship is you, the, your ruling class, your voters, have already demonstrated through potentially lethal service and grueling service that they put the needs of other people, or they put the needs of society before their own. Because someone who, who decides, all right, I'm going to sign on that dotted line. I'm going to potentially die um, to gain a to potentially gain uh, some sort of say in the government. They're they're already kind of in that that situation. They they see something wrong and they want they want to fix it. 
but they're also willing to put put up or shut up. So the the problem that I see with universal suffrage um, is quickly you get this idea that if you vote, if enough people vote for it, well, you just get it, as if there's no cost to it. You just throw in a say and not. Uh, what's the old saying? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Mm. You always pay for it. Yeah. The Ziegler, I think Ziegler coined that one. And yeah, the the best things in life are not are not free. No, I mean, you go back to Buddha and talk about life is suffering. It's like a uh, you you pay for it in one way or another. Yes. Like regardless mm -hmm. of whether you yeah, like you and you and I were talking about PTSD. Like I never went to the army, but we both ended up here. Like right. I always thought about that, like the whole life is suffering thing. Like even as somebody who loves philosophy, I've always just had a negative reaction to that statement, and I've tried it's not very a comforting thought. Well, so, I've tried, and I've tried very hard to find to get away around that. But the fact of the matter is, if you do nothing, you suffer. Like the natural, like static state of existence would be suffering. You, you have of, to act. You ever heard of the three vinegar tasters? No. It's an old painting uh, from Asian culture. And it's got three older guys tasting vinegar mm. and one's got one look on his face the other's got a different look like one thinks it's bitter one thinks it's sweet and the other one thinks it's just vinegar mm. and the three people are Lao Tzu Confucius and Buddha <laughs> <laughs> so one thinks it's sweet one thinks it's it's sour and the other one's like it's vinegar <laughs> and that's kind of philosophy yeah I can see that I mean yeah you, you, the 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 axiom that life is suffering is not inherently a negative thing. Yeah. I mean... You have to acknowledge the thing like Garrett talking... Too much pleasure can be painful. Yeah, you can have too much of a good thing. Well, too much pleasure can be damaging. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can die by having... Like being, you can phys be physically stimulated too long. Yeah. And I fire my neuron. <laughs> There it is. I knew that was coming. <laughs> what is that? Have you seen that? No. Oh, oh we got to we'll have to show. I'll, I'll have to show you that once oh God, it's so once funny. we stop recording because it is phenomenal. What is this? It, it's, it's an a, onion talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's the onion, but it's so good. You'll love it. I will talk about the, the Heinleinian political theory forever. <laughs> it, it, it is a theory I espouse. Well, it is five to, to noon. Are we are we satisfied with the, the recording? I mean, I'm am satisfied with a lot of the things we talked about. I wish okay. that I had been a little more. Well, well, I wish I needed a little less therapy. <laughs> <laughs> that was only the midsection. I mean, yeah. the first part of that was random bullshit. The midsection was therapy with Matt, and the last one was just kind of random politics and, and philosophy and religion. So we we did pretty good. That we did pretty good. That is a. Uh, this is a good good standard episode of the Arbitrarium. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no one topic was discussed. I think I think the uh, the Cincy Musings series will we're gonna we're gonna do this again. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, we make that car situation happen more often. I'll just come to Indianapolis more often. Mm. Yeah, love to have you. Well, you're the host, Matt. So play us out. To to play us out? What the fuck does that mean? To, to play us out. And it used to sting to play us out.